thank you so much for being here um, and welcome to today's online event, uh, Photography, Performance and the Mythical. It's part of a series uh, that we kicked off last month uh, as part of the Foam Talents 2021, where we pair artists to delve deeper uh, into their topics, in the topics they work with. And the aim is to introduce the artists, their project, uh, but really focus then on their approach and also on the larger uh, topics surrounding that work. And we're doing this together with a guest speaker. Uh, also tonight, we have a special guest. And this is the idea is that we can have someone else add a perspective uh, to this, uh, this paired, uh, to this reflection of the work. And of course, as you see, I'm not alone. So I want to immediately also st start introducing uh, our guests of tonight. And we have two artists here that really developed unique approaches that weave together, together photography, performance, and mysticism, and through that offer, offer a visual exploration of the topic of identity and belonging. And so, Lissandro, hi there, how are you doing? I am good, thank you for having me today. I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, we are excited that you can be here with us all the way from St. Martin. Yeah. And hi, Plantation, how are you doing? Hi. <laughs> it's good to have you. You're in France, right? So yes, I'm not that far from. Yes, I'm in Paris. Nice. It's good that you're here. And well, last but not least, our special guest, uh, Angela and Carol. Hi, Angela. How are you doing? I am doing very well. How are you? I'm good. I'm always a bit nervous with these things, which is funny because I'm just doing the intro and you guys are going to do the work. But I am very excited and I'm going to give everyone a little introduction who Angela is. And I have to say it is a, for us a pleasure to have her here and she has been writing for Foam Magazine, the portfolio text for Plantation's work. Um, she's an artist, activist, ar artist, archivist, and an investigator of art history and culture. She's a contributing writer for Sugarcane Magazine, Black Art in America, Be More Arts, and others. And she received her MFA in digital arts and new media from the University of California at Santa Cruz, and is currently teaching within film and moving image uh, at the Stevenson University in Baltimore. Thank you for being here, Angela, and I hope, of course, um, I might not have done your bi uh, biography justice, but please, anything that you'd like to add, uh, I'm happy to just hand over to you and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you, Amalie. Um, and I'm, I feel really honored to be in conversation with these two dynamic creatives. You know, we've sort of laughed and chopped it up a bit and struggled you know, even prior to this conversation about how to just articulate the awesomeness of what you all have been creating and, and building in. And so what I'll do is I'll go ahead and share my screen. And we can jump right in. And I think it's appropriate to start with a quote from the great, late great Sun Ra uh, and his orchestra an avant-garde uh, jazz musician, visionary dreamer, uh, and that he poses a question to us all that I think is important to frame this conversation in which he says, if you are not a myth, whose reality are you? If you are not a reality, whose myth are you? Uh, whose myth are you? And, and what he's dissecting really is the notion of the ways in which the world has tried to truncate and flatten in many regards black identity right, or Black identities across the diaspora. And so in that way, Black bodies and Black identities have become more myth than real, right? Um, and so I, I wanna take some time and ask a few questions of the artist about the ways in which their work uh, interrogates and pushes the bounds really of the expected gaze, the Western gaze, the European gaze, and how you trouble uh, representations of history, representations of Black identities within the present, um, Black subjects and portraits of Black identity uh, within the canon of photography uh, as, as a whole. Um, and I'm, I want to start first and foremost with, uh, with you, Lissandro, about, you know, really what, what inspires your work and why do you think that it's important to situate yourself um, and or black protagonists right uh, at the center of the images 
that you're creating? Well, thank you for the wonderful question. Um, for me, what inspires my work, I'm going to start there. Um, what, it, what forms the backbone of my work is this essence of not knowing um, of identity um, in the sense that where I'm from in St. Martin, um, my generation or a lot of us in our generation have not been schooled about our own history, our own indigenous histories, our own black histories, even within the region of the Caribbean. Um, we've only been taught that our history starts with the inception of um, Western imperialism with the arrival of Columbus bringing quote unquote civilization to us. Um, so my project kind of stems from this need to know ourselves beyond that Western paradigm, beyond that colonial and post-colonial narrative. And in, in, it is in that sense um, why I think your, um, the quote that you chose in the beginning is an apt description of my vantage points, because it's this, what is myth and what is reality and where do we hold this information from? Because for a lot of us in, in the diaspora and for a lot of people of color, um, indigenous peoples, our histories are woven into mythologies, into folk tales, into our spirituality and into our imagination. So that quote is a very beautiful starting point. Um, and I think an example of um, this conflation of myth and reality and questioning where you belong between those two, um, I think it's more of an oscillation than a static answer. Um, but this image, for example, you see um, this figure, a ghostly figure, um, submerged in the Atlantic Ocean. I took this on St. Martin, and they're wielding a shrub of cotton. And the story of cotton becomes very interesting because it has a very heavy connotation of pain. Um, it is a very harsh reality to us, but that's also the reality that we've been taught. But there is a possible other story to the story of cotton where um, cotton was perhaps more, in, um, botanically speaking, a crossbreed between um, an old African species of cotton and a new world species of cotton that was already situated in the Caribbean on Columbus' arrival. Uh, so that gives you a whole different narrative on where that cotton comes from, that it was a product of um, an, a, a, a transatlantic cultural exchange predating an inception of colonialism. And that then turns cotton into an emblem of something else, something um, beyond that which we have been taught. So it is in that way that I place figures in my work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that articulation. And I want to um, move now to you, Plantation, and you know, pose the same sort of you know, question to you as far as you know, so much of your work has been described as sort of troubling. Um, and I think it's because you, again, you're, you're bucking against you know, these ways in which uh, we are presumed to be seen as acceptable, you know? Um, you're bucking against uh, long histories of the ways in which outsider gazes have perceived or projected or created images or images of or uh, imaginaries within the ideal Black, black femininity, right? Uh, and so I'm curious about the ways in which you have incorporated your own body in much of your portfolio, as well as other Black and African protagonists uh, in the works that you create, and why that's so important um, mm -hmm. for you to situate yourself and other Black uh, female and other Black African protagonists at the, at the center of the images that you, that you render. <clears throat> this is such a heavy question. Um, for me, I think, um, moving to South Africa when I was like 16 and being in a leadership entrepreneurial school for Africans and being exposed to so many cultures and like critiquing the very rich the very rich nature of the black experience it naturally became important for me to only 
archive the black experience and the black face. Like it's a rule for me that I, I cannot take a, a picture of a person that is not black. I think something else that is interesting with my work is how through my work, I was able to give space to accepting my body, to accepting this grotesqueness, this undesirability in the world as a black um, plus size woman with knee grade features. It was really playing with, the, with my fetishization, my body's fetishization, as well as how I am not desired in terms of beauty standards and also in terms of like expectations on what a expectations of what a wanted body is today. I think I play around with a lot of these elements and through the camera I'm able to be safe, to be seen and to be human again. Normally I'm very like calm and like I don't present my body and myself when the camera, I become one again, I become intimate and true again because I'm playing with, I'm playing with people's anger, with people's disgust, with people's wants and creating this character that is plantation in the camera. For a long time, Ayomide, my name is not necessarily like this. Plantation is a character that is new and is different and is very curious and has a very radical way of thinking. And I think um, I'm obsessed with gore, with disturbing elements, with symbolizing things with disturbing elements. And sometimes to me, some images just make sense because it comes from my brain. I spend time, weeks and days, developing images in my brain until I finally come to a space and I take them. So the image is already done in my head. And then when I'm there, it's like my body has to perform and it becomes one. And it took a long while for me to come to this space where my body is free with itself and is ready to interrogate with things. Where while I was taking images of a lot of people, my friends and portraits, and really referencing the aesthetics of people like Diane Arbos to create very um, disturbing elements. I think something that really marked me was Diane Arbos's um, interview that she did. She had like these recordings of her classrooms. And she said that, um, people that are born with um with like disadvantages that they're like the princes of our society because oftentimes when you grow up you think that you're going to face a trauma that you graduate from to her she said that these disadvantaged people have born with, they were born with that trauma so they've graduated before all of us and for me it was playing this idea of trauma that we've graduated graduated from as black people and kind of representing that kind of gory and disturbing aesthetic from with elements and with color and with high contrast and high saturation to like finally come to this point where I can use my body and my character can can play with all of these elements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, uh, I want to speak to, you know, uh, another quote from Clyde Taylor, who's actually a, a scholar of um, third cinema and African cinema and black cinemas across the diaspora. But I think it, it uh, is a beautiful kind of intersection between uh, photography that features black subjects and that he says, the situation of black people in the images hierarchy is framed by the ideological contours of representation or what Michel Foucault calls power knowledge. The effectiveness of repressed people in the communication struggle either as senders or receivers through systems influenced by this hierarchy depends on their realization of the obsolescence of the contest over the nature of truth beside the contest over the control of truth and the irrelevance of beauty beside the power to choose and name beauty, right? And I think that what Taylor is sort of, you know, getting at and what both of you are doing in your work is reclaiming, right? Like having a sort of agency over the ways in which uh, Black identities as you relate to them can be articulated through uh, the filmic lens or through photography. Um, which is a powerful kind of reclamation, I think, and a radical revisioning, per, you know, definitely of the canon and of the history of photography at large, which has largely come from a kind of anthropological gaze into Africa, into the Caribbean, into the Black American experience and other, um, and other othered bodies, uh, non-white bodies throughout the world. Um, I want to 
jump in also to a quote from Toni Morrison, who again is referencing sort of the literary history here. Um, she references this term called Africanism, right? Uh, to denote for her and connotative blackness, uh, uh, African peoples have come to signify, uh, mm -hmm. as well as the entire range of views, assumptions, readings, and misreadings that characterize these people in Eurocentric eyes. And I reference that because I think, and I'll come to you, Lissandro, I think that often your work uh, is sort of conflated um, within terminologies that have become kind of kitsch and, and, with, and, and popular within popular culture, uh, catch-alls as it were. And so anything that kind of deals with uh, other worlds or um, uh, spiritual experiences of African or black identities is kind of uh, labeled as Afrofuturist, right? And so your work has been often miscategorized as uh, continuing within an Afrofuturist gaze. But I think your work is very much so and, and starkly so grounded in the present, right? Grounded in reality, right? The Blackness and the Black identities and subjects that you portray are not surreal, right? They, but they are reverent. And they do um, uh, uh, inspire us to see ourselves and challenge the world, really, to see and consider Black identities outside of the constraints that we are typically bound by. And so I'm wondering if you can speak to a little bit more um, why this is uh, important to you and to your work. Um, how you identify the work within the frame of magical realism, or if that term uh, also feels too small a frame for the, uh, the concepts that you are unpacking through your photographs. Yes, a, a part of your question, I missed a part of it because the internet lagged, but I think I got it. So I'm going to respond to what, what I think you said. Um, so um, to start with, yes, um, to address the, the problematics of conflating everything into this singular Africanism um, aspect um, or exoticism or exotic aspect. Um, it, it can be, I am very aware of when I'm taking my images that I, by using various elements that stretched across the Atlantic uh, or the Black Atlantic world and placing them in one image, you are essentially compressing a lot um, into one image and you can thereby um, maybe reduce lots of various cultures to something that's um, homogenous. But that is not my intention at all. Um, as I said before, um, my practice stems from not knowing. And in not knowing, um, in this part of the world, you often engage with imagination, you engage with folklore, mythologies, spirituality. And that is a very, to me, a very associative experience when you engage with the imagination for the production of things to know. And that engagement includes an engagement with the objects that were produced by peoples like us. So there is a kind of reaction and an invitation when you have these objects and you place them together. They do something with your mind. They do something with your spirit. And it is then a kind of meeting point um, of overlapping histories, of overlapping stories. And we can connect in the image in this way. So it is not necessarily a reduction in in my work it is more of an i don't know in, in, a, in a, to phrase it lightly uh, a gathering of ancestral spirits for a party in the image um kind of and i think just by the fact that um plantation and my work um have um significant overlaps and we've never met and we've come from different parts of the atlantic world that there is something to be said about that innate invitation to spirits, as it were, because spirit is for everyone, or that imagination that's shift with the speaker. for everyone. And then going to bringing that back to um, representation and identity, or the genre, because um, that was more the specific question, the genre, why I don't um, identify with, or identify my work with Afrofuturism, um, not that I have anything against it, but I, for me, I emphatically 
try not to have super anachronistic elements in my work that relate to any point in time in particular. Because for me, there's a timelessness to spirit and there's a timelessness to blackness. That, that timelessness is very important for me. So I really try to emphasize in my own process, whether it comes across or not, but that emphasis for me is timelessness. And why I kind of veer off from Afrofuturism is because I think that when you are seeing Black people represented in a way that you're not used to, um, AKA by Black people themselves, people aren't used to that. And they, they think this greatness is always in the future because we have this nostalgia for this future that could have been or this present that could have been. And, but that greatness is also in our past and it is also in our present. So it is me kind of challenging that paradigm of greatness only lies in the future. And I think that magic realism is a more accurate description of my work because I am dealing with um, magical elements in reality. Some people have tried to describe my work as serialistic, um, which is not the case. If anything, my art process is surrealistic because when you talk about surrealism you talk about um producing um a work or a stream of thought that is that might seem very dreamlike or illogical um that is very associative so you you really see something and then whatever pops into your mind first you do it and it becomes a part of the working process that is how i think that is my process but that is not how i express um, my work mm -hmm. my work is more an expression of magic realism in the sense that magic realism can be described as something that would that can take place but is most unlikely not to um, in the eyes of the masses and that magic realism i think is not only a part of me personally but is the part of um that black atlantic landscape where you have people that are very rational they're doctors, they're lawyers, they're economists, but there's still this underlying belief that to keep bad spirits away, you put salt in the four corners of your house, or you don't go under the tamman tree at night because there are jumbies there. Like there's always this magical element that is at the foundation of everything that is often unspoken, but it is an unspoken agreement that it exists and that it is real. And this is that magic realism um, that I identify with. And mm -hmm. I think it is a very um, apt. Um, description for a medium of photography, because when you talk about documenting imagination and documenting spirits, um, something cannot be documented on film if it did not take place in front of the lens. Mm -hmm. So I think that I answer all your questions. Yeah, beautifully so. Um, and I also wanted to add one more thing, um, leading from your quotes again on um, the representation, I forgot who it was by, but it was about um, being in charge of no one before. Yeah. So having that control of truth um, and the relevance of beauty beside the power to choose um, and name beauty. I think that is very, um, a very powerful statement. And I wanted to comment on that because as Black people and Black creators, Black artists, Indigenous um, creators, it is, we are often in spaces um, that are not made by or for us per se. So I've had, for example, very awkward um, moments where, um, talking about representation, where I'm in a group show, a group exhibition, and then there was um, a European person, for example, that um, ventured into um, the black urban landscape and documented people from the ghettos. And then they um, portray them in certain ways because that is their vantage point of black identity. Um, while I'm in the same space exhibiting my work, but I also come from the ghetto and I'm actually still situated in the ghetto in the, the Caribbean. So then you have this real juxtaposition or I'm very aware of how people see me in that image or how they would see me because they wouldn't see me that way because I'm in a museum space or in a gallery space. So in that moment, I'm not that. Um, but if I'm at home, they could have photographed me in the street in that way, but that's not how I would ever let myself be photographed, for example. Um, 
I would, how I see myself and how I see our people is the way that I express it in my work. And that is a very different, magical, more timeless element that is not rooted in materiality. Because materiality of the post-colonial society has failed us, essentially. Mm. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say about that quote, because that really spoke to me. Mm. Yeah, no, definitely. Thank you. And I wanted to also kind of have you speak to a little bit more um, I'm pulling a quote from our conversation um, the other day in which you note, the image is the invitation to engage with history. And I think it's a really important um, kind of framing for your work and also uh, an important uh, catalyst for the images that you're drawn to. So can you talk about the ways in which the images that you create um, that again, acknowledge this sort of the thin line between the magical and the real for African diasporic communities, um, how that uh, engages with, with history, you know, with the capital H as it were. Mm, okay, I'm going <coughs> to answer what I think um, the question is. Okay, so um, for me, why I say that the image is an invitation um, to engage with history is because for me, questions are more important than answers. Questions of knowing how to know something is more important than what to know. So my work, the, the goal is not to give people answers. This is your history. This is your identity. This is how you should go about it. No, um, the images are nice, yes. And it's to be, it, for me, it is <coughs> that draws people in to um, engage with what they see and to engage with their own imagination and what they see in the image and kind of pull from it the elements that are relevant to them. Um, and in that way, they can ask themselves, um, for example, why does this mask or why does this smoke or why does this um, nature, why does this um, awaken something in me? What associations do I have with it? Um, and why, what, is, what are all the underlying histories of myself um, that um, kind of contribute to this um, aesthetic experience with this image. And I think from there, once you start to dissect your own experience with um, an expression of someone else's history, in this case, mine, then you kind of get to um, asking the right questions or trying to figure out what questions to ask. And why I want people to ask questions more than look for answers in my work is because there's never one answer to identity. Mm. Um, even for one person living in, in an entire life, your identity is dynamic. It always it changes over time depending on your experiences and depending on your goals and where you are situated. So I think in that sense, questions of identity um, and how you relate to it um, are more important. And the work itself, the image itself can never um, give you a straight answer because I also think that would be a boring image but it's an invitation um, to engage with the image but also with yourself as to what your history um, can be and in a sense where it relates to um, Afro spirituality is that it is also you can talk about divination um, when you when you talk about this approach to them. You can divine an image the same way you can divine Kari Shog or divine tarot cards. You divine the image for yourself. I mean, in Western academia, we call it an image analysis and semiotics, but in a spiritual aspect or in indigenous knowing, you call it divination, the divination of the image, your engagement with um, the imaginal or the imaginary continuum of this world, because everything comes from somewhere. There's always a root to every aspect. So yeah, it is in that sense that it's an invitation. Awesome. And uh, Plantation, I wanna jump to you a bit as well and, and come back to the Sandro um, a little bit later. But Plantation, you, you noted that um, birthed from Portraits in Madness, and we're gonna talk about a new series of works called Black Sex is Forbidden, uh, Black Death is... Uh, Black Death is Permitted. Black Death is Permitted. Uh, and so Black Sex is Forbidden is a symbol of Black femininity and diasporic Black suffering. 
It is a visual world found in abandoned spaces and homes using neglect to explore systemic oppression. And I'm gonna start with an image uh, by Deanna Lawson, uh, because in our conversations, you said that much of this work, uh, which is a continuum of an earlier body of work, uh, is inspired or influenced by, by the intimate interiors uh, within this body of work by Deanna Lawson. And so can you talk a little bit about uh, your inspirations for this body of work, um, the title of, you know, of the body of work, and also the evolution of your, of your practice as far as the images that you were querying in uh, the previous series and now the images that you're unpacking in this current series? Um, I first of all would just love to, because a lot of the things Lysandra was saying was just so powerful, like it has like be commented on, is this idea of magical realism. And it's like the fact that, you know, the African spirit and the black spirit and by black, I would even describe black right now as in indigenous, like the indigenous spirit is the most valid and the most present spirit. And it remains and it's, it's constantly present. I remember last year when I was curious about starting like to reference indigenous spirituality in my work. And, you know, I was asking my uncle, because my uncle like does research with, I think, um, the Yoruba culture and where I'm from. I'm from Ogun State. And he has like a book on it and I was asking him, oh, I'm, I would like to do start this. How do you think I should start? And he was like, your name is spiritual. Like Oluwa Kayomide, God has brought me joy. I mean, a lot of names in Nigeria, like Chimamanda, Chidera, you know, um, Oluwa Toi, Oluwa Tobi Loba, Shemilo uh, Ray, it's all to praise the divine. And the African spirit is so present. And you know, you, you have these stories of, photographers going to shrines, they take images, they travel and then they die. It's because it's so present, it's so powerful. It, it's like, it is there. And so it's, it's like magical realism because it's present. And it's something that as an indigenous person, you know it's real. Like when you say witchcraft is real, um, spirituality is real, it is real. And even how the work starts is with the logical. A lot of my work last year was really logical. I would be in trances listening to like a lot of, a lot of, for a long while, a lot of the music, a lot of the things I would do would be put myself in trances since I was like younger, listening to psychedelic music or like just putting myself in a state emotionally that my brain has to be influxed by, by, by images. Like I just ran on images. I would spend two hours shutting everything down, sitting down, listening to music, forcing myself to be in pain to have images in my brain. It was like the most important thing. And then in 2020, it took such a turn where, like, um, like Lysandra said, picking up elements of the divine, not necessarily following a single, like a single um, spiritual story. Like I'm, like I'm not directly re referencing Yemanja, I'm referencing the Yoruba divine. And, you know, I would, I would talk to professors and I will talk to professors and researchers. Um, there's this big lady called Caribbean Archives. Um, her name is Zainab. And she did a lot of like research on the Candomblé. And I sat down with her and she described everything for me. And I remember just like the moment I heard that, it was like my brain began to have these three colors, red, black and white in every single image and black has nothing to do with Yemanja blue has something to do with Yemanja mm -hmm. which I see in Lysandra's image of the cotton in the ocean and the blue hands and but these colors were in my mind and I had to perform as a divine it was like I would listen to music go on trances I'll walk down um my my estate in Nigeria where I live mm -hmm. and it was like taking walks and, you know, I remember um, reading um, Rahima Gambo, um, to, um, to 2019's From Talent. She talked about walking as being part of her methodology. I began to understand what she meant. And this act of walking while being on a trance and yes, yeah, yeah, ruminating on the words of professors and writers on the divine and even friends that explore the divine. One of my friends, Agu Wotega, and I would just have these images in my mind. 
and it was a very mm-hmm. like weird process that I can't really describe. And I think last when I had a conversation with Lisandro, he said it for what it was, was that I was almost like I was possessed or I was carrying out the images for another divine person. And I remember a professor seeing one of my performances and she said that I dance exactly like the worshippers in Brazil. She said it's like a sect, but I forgot. And that was when I knew that a lot of the stuff I was doing that time was from like another being. Um, I have stopped exploring the divine. I realized, I think I mentioned this with Angela, that it, I realized it's not for me. Um, <laughs> if you are studying the divine, you must worship the divine because it is so, like, it's, it's not for everybody. Not everybody is like Jenny Liatiku. It's for very, it's for people that have decided to commit their lives to this spirituality. And I realized that that's not what I want to do. And now my project Black Sex is Forbidden is very much, it's very much strict. And it's just like, I was looking at Dina Lawson for a long time and Solange. And I was looking at the images of Dina Lawson and her processes of traveling through Congo, traveling through Haiti, um, traveling through black communities in, in, in America. And the way she collaborates with bodies the way she collaborates with people and you know this image of a man resting his head on his girlfriend's bosom and this idea of black love and when you think of love and black people when you think of love you think of two white people kissing a knife with her you don't think of black bodies taking space black bodies with passion passion that is respectable passion that is not even respectable you know passion that is passion passion that is valid and you never think of that you you think of it as this very um absurd or hypersexualized um like it's it's always like the black sexual body is always weirdly degraded and it was like this idea of love and 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 sex and sexuality and there was also a lot of reflections on what the black body is allowed to do and what the black woman is allowed to do especially growing up in post-colonial times and religion and the violence of Christianity, where as a woman, you realize that your body is first owned by God, your father and your mother, and then your community. And it's that very painful process of breaking away from the, like the shackles of purity culture and, and, and owning, and owning your shape, your face, your arms, your breasts, your, your stomach, and it's a long process. And it was also going to this idea of death and how do you, how how do you represent death in photography and this is an ongoing project that i'm still exploring is this idea of death and representation and when we think of death we think of black bodies we we normalize the death of black body we normalize the death of black bodies it's something that's accepted it's something that i don't blink an eye and i know that i'm i'm anti black because i i'm a child that is Gen Z growing up in a post-colonial time, a hyper-religious family. I am anti-black. And you know, when you think well, like the when you think of like the catastrophes that, that happen in Germany, you know, you're met with shock. But I think over hundreds of people died in South Africa um, the past few weeks. Um, thousands of students have been kidnapped in Nigeria. Thousands have been killed in Nigeria. And, you know, I, I would look at the news in Nigeria and I, I, I honestly don't care. I'm not moved because my death is normalized. My, I am just a number. And also, I, I am also a victim and I am also a perpetrator of this violence and indifference. And it's, it's this um, very interesting paradox is that I am a perpetrator of violence and a victim of violence. And I'm also still a victim of violence. Like my perpetration is just a tiny little bit. I'm just living in the residue of my white masters. And so it's this deep reflection. And also, again, what Lisandro said of the white man taking pictures of our spaces. I would even provoke, what about the privileged Black person taking pictures of the underprivileged black spaces where is the intentionality and the ethics of that and that's the burden of the black photographer because black photography is inherently political so me i remember i was mentioning angela that i had the privilege growing up to be afraid of lagos 
because of the way I was brought up. And many people did not have that privilege to be afraid of Lagos. They had to exist, they had to hustle, they had to work. So it is important that my work be critiqued for its naivety, for its, its lack of understanding of the true nature of the violence in Nigeria. It's important that I question myself before I go to black spaces and my privilege in acting in those spaces and the, and the violence my camera can act on by putting on aesthetics that they did not ask for. So there's a lot to think about. Yeah, thank you, Eva. Um, I want to uh, move forward with a, a short quote uh, from Alexis Duvaux, uh, scholar, poet, uh, writer, uh, who says, survival is a four letter word. Mm -hmm. And I think much of the work uh, that you're exploring, Plantation, you know, again, speaks to this and bucks against it uh, and bucks also against the notion that uh, these images, particularly your work with Sandro, have to be steeped in the struggle narrative. Um, and this particularly stark within um, Black American experiences, right? Uh, African experiences, the, the Caribbean. If you are creating images that do not uh, stay, win, stay within or are situated within grief, trouble, struggle, uh, then are they authentic Black experiences, right? Uh, and I think both of you are problematizing that um, in, in really important ways. I wanna uh, turn a little bit and ask more questions about your, your process, right? Uh, and so, Lysandra, we'll, we'll jump back to you. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your, your process in creating these images? How much of uh, the way in which you work is researched, planned, uh, sort of plotted, written out, sketched out, uh, versus how much of it is intuitive. Um, you going, feeling, making, uh, seeing what comes out uh, while you're in these environments. I think um, what, what Plantation was saying before, um, I think that we have a very similar work processes, or processes um, in which it's, can be described in, in, in the Western mind as um, surrealistic or shamanistic. But I think when you, so for me, I do a lot of reading um, on various histories. Um, there's a spiritual aspect as well, where you get to know certain deities and how they play a role in our reality as is. And it all kind of comes together in some kind of um, subconscious expression um, that manifests itself in the image. Um, so, for example, I, I do not go to a set where I know exactly what I'm going to make. Um, I, I set the parameters for knowing or I set the parameters for engagement by choosing a location um, or choosing a person I would like to work with or I bring suitcases of elements with me um, on sets. But I do not know what's going to materialize until it takes place. And in that sense, it's a very um, associative um, an engagement with the imagination and perhaps some would say an engagement with the spirits of a place because you, I go to a place and I'm going to see what is going to manifest today, if anything manifests at all. And I think a lot of artists have this kind of engagement with reality or engagement with um, their imagination as if there is a continuum of some sort um, that kind of feeds um, some kind of knowledge to us about certain things because in some, with some images, in and analyzing them in retrospect, I find that they fit certain um, um, deities or um, icons quite literally, um, almost. So for me, the the image and the knowledge that is produced kind of is like a dance of um, two snakes. They kind of weave in and out of each other, and there is no chronology for me for my research um, practice. Um, and I think that speaks to um, what are valid ways of knowing. And I think when we talk about works um, like Plantation and Mind that are trying at least, trying to be decolonial, we have to also ask, what does it take to be colonial? What does it really take to shift away from Western paradigms and Western um, imperial regimes? And one of those ways is to 
kind of decolonize how we know of things. And this is why I say how to know of something is more important than what, because in how you know something, you are a lot closer to who you are than in answering and being able to answer what um, we need to know. So it, with that being said, um, a decolonial um, way of knowing or research practice would incorporate indigenous ways of knowing, which in the West um, or by European paradigms or academia would seem absurd. Um, but that does not mean they're not valid. And that validity or the validation of knowledge or which institutions can house that knowledge or authenticate it, that is a, a very dangerous power structure to have because it really um, renders a lot of people, a lot of people's engagement with reality um, voiceless. Um, so I just wanted to um, say that. But mm -hmm. for my working process, yeah, um, it's, yeah, I don't go into it knowing what is, <laughs> what is going to happen. And there's, for me, um, you will always find elements of nature in my work because I think nature allows for the imagination to breathe. And also in indigenous and black um, philosophies, we came to the earth to learn from nature. We came to earth to learn from mother nature herself. So our identity, lies in that nature and that's why it is very important for me to work on location because for me that knowledge and that memory of self is also embedded in that reality and i think that's why it works so naturally for me to engage with the spaces and to kind of um capture these apparitions mm -hmm. um thank you for that and and i think it's also important to note that like none of your work has any sort of digital manipulation other than, you know, sort of general color correction. So in that way, the costumes that you employ, the colors that you're pulling out, the um, landscapes that you are embodying your subjects in, and even the subjects that you're choosing are all weighted uh, in this way. So uh, can you talk a little bit about, you know, sort of your choice of the aesthetics that you're bringing into your images uh, the the design, the uh, adornments that your subjects are wearing and how that relates to uh, this sort of intuitive process and practice of the, narr the, the new narratives that you're creating. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, simply said, I'm a collector of objects. So for me, there is really, um, it is very personal whatever happens in these images because there is really a personal engagement with this, these objects and myself. So I would literally put some of these clothes on and I would feel them. I would like dance and I would make movements. I would really try to embody these objects. I wear the masks. I have them in my spaces. I am always looking at them. There's always this um, subconscious um, relationship with these objects and this um, element of play and how they um, come together. That is something that really happens in the space with the, the person who I'm engaging with there, because that's another entire element. Um, the person who, with whom I'm working, which is also kind of selected on the basis of, is our way of working and our way of thinking um, compatible? So um, how do I, oh, sorry. Uh, how do I, am I answering your question? Because I'm, I'm just checking. Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> yeah, you are. I, you know, and I'm thinking about, you, and you noted that, you know, you're a collector of objects and items, and I'm looking at this beautiful, you know, uh, adornment that the figure on the right is wearing. And we know that that is coming from, that is a colonial era garb, right? So there's there's a weight to those images right as well as the traditional mask that the subject on the left is wearing there are weights it isn't just um ornamental right that you're making these decisions it isn't just for the aesthetic value there's an actual tether to colonial histories and i think that um why objects are so important for me or these man-made objects is because within them are woven um, elements of our past or past paradigms. And I think that's why, for example, in fashion, fashion is very important for me. Like what the what these um, entities are wearing is super important for me 
um, because within fashion is also a continuum of imagination. Um, actually, for my master's thesis at the University of Amsterdam, I did an image analysis based on fashion. So it was like a fashion image analysis to kind of determine um, why were people in the bushes of Suriname wearing um, top hats and canes and a trench coat? Like for me, that was like, why? And then it's like, you kind of, kind of, you can dissect that they were um, uniformed that way or peoples of power um, or chiefs um, in these bushes were um, dressed and their power was validated by European colonizers through dress. So you have these histories. And the thing is, if you just see this person not knowing all these histories and layers behind it, you would just think, oh, that person's wearing a trench coat and a top hat because they think it's pretty. But no, there's always an idea behind something, whether you are aware of it or not. So that's why I also rely on that intuition and rely on that engagement with imagination and see what comes up naturally, because I am doing things subconsciously for a reason because I did grow up in a post-colonial landscape. I did, uh, I do have this decolonial mindset, I think, um, but there's still this subconscious there that thinks that certain elements should go together or shouldn't, and mm -hmm. that be analyzed. And that is that engagement with the image for the spectator, because now I pass it on to the audience and they can critique it, they can agree, they can have a whole different experience with the image, but it is kind of this document of an imagining um, and that's how I mean it's a documentary of imagination um, because you, everybody can engage with it because it is now kind of objectified or it has manifested in some kind of icon where people can have an intellectual, psychic, cultural exchange with it. Um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, Plantation, I want to move to you a bit and, and talk about pose the same question to you in regards to, to process and practice. And in our conversation together, you talked a little bit about uh, the ways in which you want your work to be, uh, go even deeper into uh, research and orientation, which I thought was interesting because I feel like your work is already very much so founded by and grounded in a deep uh, you know, research approach. Uh, but can you, can you talk a little bit about um, some, what your process is when you are unpacking these images, um, similar to what you spoke to earlier, as far as, you know, you sort of seeing a body of work by another photographer and that kind of taking you on a trajectory to want to create other works. Is that typically this, the case? Are you seeing things that inspire your imaginary and then make you want to start a series or are you grounded or founded in a book or, or literature, or can it be any and all of the above? Um, or are there times when it's just more intuitive? Mm, I think um, because for a long time I was self-taught, it was really just um, a lot of research in terms of artists. And, you know, I would sit down and I would spend hours just listening to how artists thought. And like it would be a select few and I would study their works because I was trying to develop my aesthetic. I think my attraction to being more research-based in terms of archives and books and writings and um, papers and academic and, uh, academic journals is maybe because I'm entering like a very Beaux Arts and traditional contemporary art education. So because of my exposure to more criticism, there is a call and an urgency for my work to be more grounded. Because at the moment, personally, I feel like it's not as grounded as it should be. There's so, still so much more work to do because from research and from the writings of other people, aesthetics can grow and develop in ways. And I think, um, again, just listening to Lissandro and through his research, he's able to play in the spaces and let his elements interact in spaces and become natural and become one. I think my fixation on the aesthetics is I have developed the brain, so the images so meticulously in my mind. I don't know how to walk outside of those boxes and I want to walk outside of those boxes at the moment. I think um, right now my work is trying to explore the installation space virtually and physically is how do you present work virtually that it tells people to sit down and stay and I think again why I reference Solange's Solange's Black Planet her website it's so simple but it's so interactive in a way that cannot be described 
like every time you load the page, a new video comes up that you can't even like go back to the old video again and you have to continue loading so it gives you to a different page and it's almost like she's designed it for you to sit down shut up and listen and see black excellence and i think there's questions of how do you present work physically that it captures your essence and what you're thinking of aesthetically there's also questions of how do you interact with marginalized groups because you know a lot of black art is taken from marginalized spaces put in Western institutions and those same marginalized spaces that the art was from cannot interact in those spaces. They're not allowed into the exhibition space. They're not allowed to interact with in between the confines of the white wall. Thus it's important, how do I present art in a way that it interacts with marginalized spaces? How do I install art that interacts with marginalized spaces? I feel like there are a lot of artists in Nigeria that are exploring this right now through performance arts um, initiatives and how do I do that when I'm coming back to Nigeria and also as I'm in France working in spaces and also this idea of presenting work in abandoned spaces to show thoughts on black decay and just this degeneration of like like in Nigeria this 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 ballad of degeneracy of every single institution and death and how we don't have I think um I think seeing my mother's health difficulties this year and looking at in Nigeria, how she could have almost died, looking at classmates that have died in Nigeria for no reason, because the health, the health infrastructure is just completely destroyed and in shambles. And so it's, how do I, how do you archive reduction and loss in institutions in life through the installation space and also thinking employing my body and i think something that sandra said about fashion and i think um coming to europe and not having the textures and the buildings of of nigeria it's like learning to paint again with the camera because you are learning how to like present work work in like a western space with the clean sidewalks with with like the peed gutters, but it's a bit too, it's a bit too grayish and it doesn't have the brown and the green of, of Africa. And so how do I even use my body in these spaces? Because in Nigeria, it's easy for me to, you know, paint myself, get a cab, go back home. And you're in France and then you have to take the metro or you have to take the bus because you can't afford Uber. And it's like, <laughs> and it's like learning to paint again with my body. And it's reflections on how do I wrap my body with ropes? How do I squeeze my fat, my, myself with, with textures to present this enraged sexual presence, this black woman with, with, her, swollen, with her swollen form? And thinking, how do you do this without paint? Because you can't afford to be messy and then be on a bus back home in France. And so there's a lot of reflections that are going on right now in terms of how my work should be presented and how, in terms of how my work should be done. And it's something that I'm trying to, to think of and give myself space because I don't give myself space a lot. I like to be on the run to create a lot, but now I'm realizing that I want to play a game with photography as well as I want to be very deliberate with some images where what in my brain is expressed completely and then the other side taking images of black brown people as they have these expressions and like playing around with them to like i think in my, in my other slides especially in my older work um a lot of the things are there um these are th this is the installation work i am doing um there are some older works yeah, before this, um, there are portraits of people. I don't think it's included here, but it was, it's like in the last page of even the selection by form, and you have these expressions of people contorted, and if a friend of mine raising his arms up, I think I want to go back to this rawness and immaturity that my old one cut. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, and I'm curious for for you both. Um, 
since both of you, uh, both of these bodies of work, both Lissandro and Plantation, Ghost Island and Black Sex is Forbidden, Black Death is Permitted, are, are bodies of work that are still very much so in process. Um, and you have sort of expressed to me that these are works that will kind of continue to iterate or present themselves in various iterations, you know, as you, as you continue to explore uh, and strengthen your creative voice and vision. Uh, can you discuss or share any thoughts now about your thoughts or your hopes for how the work will continue to, to progress? Um, do you see these as traveling bodies of work? Do you see yourself as sort of situating yourself or the protagonist in your images in different landscapes uh, across the world? Um, anything that you wanna share? And this is a question to, to both or either of you. Do you want to go first or me or you go first <laughs> okay. well um for me well why it's a a longer project for me is because i am the topic is very big i am trying to or my goal as it were is to document the imagination of the black atlantic and that is a very big region it's a very big topic it encompasses lots of people it's not even something that's possible to do in one lifetime perhaps but it is and I am engaging with re with reality and with identity in that way, and in the same way, it's I'm interacting with the world. It's also um, helping me to grow and to learn as a person. Because remember, my whole point of view and starting point was not knowing. Um, and I think as a person, you are always um, trying to learn and trying to improve yourself, and thus try to understand your own identity as it transforms at the same time. So it is Ghost Island for me is also um, the way because Ghost Island, I made it as I, the, the reason why I call it Ghost Island is, is, is an, imagine, an imagined place where people, the audience, myself can visit um, and engage with spirits, ancestors, forgotten lore um, of their choosing and take away from it um, what is relevant to them. Um, and in that way, it kind of forms the subconscious parts of ide our identity. And for me, it is a life's work because you can never take that subconscious um, part away. You're always in engagement with it, whether you know it or not. And I always think I will have that, the urge to express that. Beautiful. And Plantation? Um, I think Black Sex is Forbidden is a project that it's within the framework of three years in my head. And it's something that I'm going to launch as installation projects in Nigeria and also in, in France and wherever I may be and centered in black communities. And I feel like visually is something that's going to continue to grow. And I'm going to employ a lot of animals and dead parts. There are a lot of images that are in my brain that I must, like it's almost like imperative that I symbolize what does death mean to me? And I think playing with the, the dead cow, I think a cow and the flesh of a cow representing death is something that is so interesting. And it's also this commentary on we kill the cow and we are the cow and wearing the, the, the skin of cow and the flesh of rams. And it's also interesting that right now it's Eid in, in Lagos, Nigeria. And you know, the celebration and the the ram being being like like in the in the prayers and like during Salah, the ram being killed. And just like everyone watching, I mean like if someone Western was there, they would be like shocked, like animal rights. But this is just like such it's like a celebration. And it's quite interesting to play with this grotesqueness and again normalization of death and wearing that on my body is something that i'm seeking to explore is carrying the is carrying the animal on my body and and i don't know it's like it's very gory but to me it's like something that must be done i'm playing with these colors red white and black that is going to continue to follow my work wherever i go red to represent blood and death white to represent almost this um cheeky revolution and this and black to black to represent whatever I represent, you know. And I also think playing with playing with fatness and shapes, 
playing with sex, playing with sexuality, playing with queerness, expressing queerness in my work, um, exploring like exploring um, um, identities that are marginalized, calling for Nigerians to critique the ideas of revolution. Revolution for all is not really revolution for all for Nigerians. And you know, during the end size, you would have queer gay Nigerians protesting with their flags, and then they will be ambushed and told to go. That why are they bringing their drama here? And it's like you want to pick and choose your revolution. Then you have sexism perpetrated in religious institutions, where there's this there's this oppression of the black woman subjugated to roles that our ancestors, not even, it's not even about ancestors, like in the forties and in the tens that they were not even doing. And it's important that this work grows as I do more research, as I listen to more people and wherever I goes is wherever I goes, but it has a three year limit and then I'm done. <laughs> And then after, and then climate change can get us all. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so I want to pause for a second from our conversation and invite uh, viewers who, who are tuning in. Uh, if you have any questions for the artist, please feel free to include your questions in the chat box. And our team at FOAM will be sure to look at those questions and pick them up. I do want to take a moment to acknowledge a few comments that have come in that I think um, are really beautiful and give um, our, our artists an opportunity to respond to these comments if, if you feel it appropriate. Uh, we have one uh, comment that came in from Antonio Baltadakas, and apologies if I am mispronouncing your last name, who says photography is a unique visual language that cannot be expressed in words. As a matter of fact, if it can be expressed in words, then it probably isn't worth phot uh, photo uh, photographing. And I, I think that that's an interesting um, perspective and very much so what you all are doing with the image is articulating what has not been allowed to be articulated or at least has not been acknowledged uh, within other mediums. And so can you guys, do you have any thoughts about uh, that comment or uh, anything to sort of add to that notion? Well, I think the comment speaks for itself and I think we both agree with this um, greatly. Um, as I said, I don't know, or I think Plantation and I both have that, that we don't know what is going, to, what exactly is going to take place in the spaces that we create and photography kind of helps us to manifest that. And if, and I think there's also an important aspect to our photography is that we engage with our own works afterwards to see what did we know um, before and after um, making the work um, and what came to us during the process of making. Um, and I think in that sense, photography is, and an even as any form of um, artistic expression is, that process of making is very important because you cannot, there are a lot of things you cannot put into words. And this again is that um, indigenous way of knowing, that decolonial way of knowing, just because you can't um, formalize it in an, intelligible way academically doesn't mean that it does not play a role in the formation of your identity or reality. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's um, what you said just now, it's uh, making me reflect on um, Phyllis Galembo in her book, Divine Inspiration, where she said that the, the Benin shrine has more artistic and spiritual power than all of like Europe's archives. And I think Black arts, Indigenous arts, is something that is so powerful. And it's something that we must continue. And we must continue in many of its expressions. It doesn't have to be like deliberately political. I believe it's inherently political because people always, people are always like projecting. But I also feel like it's a powerful fo force that makes um, white people and non-black people really really think deeply on how have they perpetrated violence i also think it's 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 a it's a form especially 
in the works of queer photographers that we remember a lot of queer photographers that have shaped how we think of of work it's it's something that makes heterosexual or cis 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 um, people like myself or heterosexual people really think deeply on how have they been violent towards others with their language and it's something i think again when i create i think of my problematicness i think of how much i have to grow from my problematic opinions and how much i have to really why do i think this way why am i prejudiced why am i why am i believing these kind of things and undoing that very that very undoing that undoing that as well as i feel like photography allows us to define who our leaders are to really think about who are our leaders you know leaders that perpetrate violence on women or queer people we have many of them and we don't really think that should they be our leaders we just celebrate them because of how they talk because how of, of how interesting they push themselves to be but through photography and art we're giving it a chance even like memes like <laughs> we're giving a chance to really think deeply on what do we who do we define as a leader and what do we define as the end times and the end of the world and you know i think now with climate change and with so many things there's a move from it's the end of the world to it's the end it's the end of humanity and we are now victims of the oligarchs violence of the taking of money of jeff bezos going to space and not staying there forever <laughs> And it's like, we really just have to think it's end of humanity and the world will continue to exist because it's existed for billions of years. And now we have this nice time to really think, what can we do? How have we been evil? How do we repay and ask for forgiveness between ourselves? You know, because we're energy, we're spirits. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So um, we are going to uh, end with a really beautiful comment from uh, Ruz van der Jatt. And again, apologies if I am uh, mispronouncing your last name, who says, never forget uh, that we are standing on the shoulders of our ancestors. I found that magical. And he is referencing you know, uh, an earlier part of our conversation. But truly, I, I will say that it has been such a, a pleasure uh, and just incredibly beautiful to be in conversation uh, with you both, who I, I truly believe and know are standing. You, your agungun are, are, are with you, are guiding you, will continue to you know, bless you in infinite ways. And I'm so excited about the works that you will continue to make. And I'm incredibly moved and proud of you for the works that you have made thus far. So I will uh, turn that over, turn the conversation over to um, Amali, who will uh, close us out with last announcements from FOAM. Uh, thank you so much. I think, I, I think the audience is in awe because this was a beautiful conversation. It was great to have you three together. It's also, I was, it's amazing to listen to you together. And I'm happy we could bring you uh, under this talk, in this space, in the digital, um, yeah. And, I want to let the audience know that this is of course an invitation to also go deeper and to discover more about the artists, check out their Instagrams. We're going to post them, follow also Angela, see what she's doing because yeah, it's, it's three amazing people that you met tonight and well, follow up on them, what they're doing. Uh, we will do the same and the recording will later be online, um, also on Facebook and on YouTube. And the artists actually are having a digital exhibition coming up that will be launched at the end of August. So there's also soon the work to be seen and to experience in the digital space. And we are having a next talk coming up uh, called Boyhood on Masculinity and Urbanism. And it's uh, the last one in the series with two speakers, uh, Delali and Solene Gül. Uh, so yeah, stay tuned on our socials to see what's happening. And Thank you so much, everyone, and enjoy your evening. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Be safe, family.